We are now recording. Excellent. And um, Kath, if you do, you want me to pull up the agenda or just read it briefly? I, I think I think since it's a pretty simple agenda, just just read it. Read it. Um, and I see that Earl has joined us, so maybe introdu introduce Earl, and then we can reintroduce him. <laughs> Hi, Nancy. Great. Welcome, Earl. <laughs> We're so happy that you are able to be here with us tonight. Thank you. All right. So I think we did a good time to get started, and then we can Lynn is could keep an eye on the attendees for us and make intermittent <laughs> announcements if people want to be brought in. Okay, well, welcome everyone to our District 1 meeting, and we are really excited to be here. Our last meeting was in person, and we're doing this one, obviously, via Zoom. Tonight, um, we are going to um, have an excellent presentation by Kathy on the Elementary School Building Project, and then I'll talk a little bit about the reparations work. And then we will be welcoming Earl Miller, our incredible CRESS director, and Earl will be sharing information about CRESS and, and what CRESS has been up to. And then we will open it up for discussion. So we'll leave plenty of time for questions and open discussion at the end. And we made an announcement earlier, but if anyone is out in the audience that has joined us who would like to be in the room, the way we've seen, just raise your hand. And Lynn is, Lynn is here both to help us out, but also she is great on the elementary school building. We've been doing tag team presentations. <laughs> so you think, it's, it's, should, should I start? I yeah. think you should start, yeah. Okay, so share my screen. And just quickly while Kath is doing that, um, this meeting is being recorded and we will not be using the chat during the meeting. So I, the charts I'm talking off of this tonight. This is an update on reparations as well as primarily. The, the charts I'm talking off of tonight, um, some of you, if you've come to forums, you may have seen, but I've really pulled them together from several different talks as we um, start to make sure people know what, what we're talking about when we say the elementary school. And as chair of the building committee and also as town councilor, I've really been privileged to be with this from the beginning. And I totally see this as building for our future. And when I say our future, it's our kids' future and also our town's future. You know, very simply, I'm going to do an, an overview of the school and the design and then get to the May 2nd vote. Um, here you can see the cast of characters. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of a very large, a very active, hardworking building committee uh, team. And the key date that's coming up is May 2nd. If that we get a positive vote, a majority vote, construction will start in 2024, and we hope the school will then open in 2026. This is a brand new elementary school that will replace Fort River and Wildwood with one school serving 575 students, grades kindergarten through fifth grade. And that's with the expectation and the plan to move the sixth grade up to the middle school. It's a three-story design with two grades per floor. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that provides as a way of collaboration and exciting opportunities for the teachers and the kids throughout, particularly through the influence of several active participants from uh, North Amherst, um, including Bruce Caldwell. It's in a daylight filled. There's a real been stress on daylight throughout the design and indoor and outdoor learning capacity. By locating it at the Fort River site, the school can be built while the current school stays open with there's ample space. And the project is restoring the fields for the community um, as well as providing a new home for children. And last but not at all least is it's going to be the town's first net zero public building. It's an all electric, highly efficient, energy efficient building 
uh, with ground source heat pumps, of, often known as geothermal, and solar panels on site for renewable. Uh, the big take homes I think about what make this project particularly exciting is its design. Education drove the design. Um, stu it's student centered. The teachers inform the layout of the classrooms and the content and the learning and the curriculum. As I mentioned, just went briefly, and I'll show you later, the three for a layout. The way the classrooms sit across the aisle from each other allows cross age and small project learning that can be across grade, across age and teams. The sustainable energy design, I think is gonna be a model for our kids. It's not just an exciting thing for climate, um, but the kids are gonna be, gonna be living in there and we can be teaching the future leaders of Amherst, of our country about environment and about uh, what it means to be sustainable. There's a real focus on cost, on cost savings, choosing, Fort River for the ease of building while the current school stays open means we're less likely to have construction delays. We can really um, facilitate um, a, a faster rollout of the plan. The materials have been selected with uh, emphasis on long lasting but lower cost uh, materials. And the three floor design is very energy efficient as well as um, has a smaller footprint. We're expecting a facility grant from the Ma Massachusetts School Building Authority, and the estimate of exactly what that is is still a bit in flux, and I'll talk about that later. The, it will be a community resource. This is a school, but we also have designed it so it can be used by the community after hours. The upgraded community fields are broadly used but for recreation for adults as well as students, and um, there will be, it will be a resiliency hub. This is the current site uh, of the Fort River site. And there's this little darted dark line that may be hard to see, but that's where the existing school is. The new school here is going to be built more than a hundred feet away. And the site really allows a fence around it that protects the kids, but also the kids can watch it as it's going up. It's gonna be a pretty exciting project. And these are this, all this area out here are various playgrounds, but also learning areas. And I'll show you this with a virtual tour. The site is big enough to allow the buses to come in and, and go out at one place and the cars to come in and go out in the north side so they don't have to cross over. And there's plen there'll be plenty of room for parking, but also for buses and vans and handicap access. So the, the site has really facilitated a whole lot of things that would have been difficult otherwise. Um, I'm showing you just the first floor design to give you a sense of what I've been talking about with layout. The first floor has a ca the cafeteria and the gymnasium with an entrance, a secure entrance here that will vestibule where people will have to be checked in. They can't just walk into the school. And then this whole back area where the purple is, is where the classrooms are. This can be shut off from the community space. And this is true upstairs as well, where the library and the art room and the music rooms are down here. And each floor, so here you see the kindergarten and the first graders are on this floor, the little kids, they're gonna be across the aisle from each other with project areas. So this is what I was meaning about the potential for collaboration, that these can, you can have small teams be working out in, in this area. And this is repeated up to the upper floors. Now, thanks to this amazing design team we've had, is they've given us a way to get an experience of the school by a virtual tour of what's going on. And this is that entrance I showed you at the beginning. And as we whirl around, if I can control this video, um, this is where people will be entering and be greeted. Then as you come around, this is the north side of the building. So this uh, facing away from the sun, is the cafeteria on the bottom floor and the library on the top. The cafeteria, kids will be able to come outside and eat at tables. This has been a highly valued experience during COVID and we're hoping to continue it. When you get back to the classrooms, um, they're gonna be looking out on this side, the outdoor fields and this swirling around area, it's, it's just 
uh, platform right now. We're going to be, hopefully, as we move forward, have a site team, uh, a, a group that says exactly what these play areas should look like. What are the learning areas look like? We haven't picked equipment yet. As you come around to this other side, the teachers emphasize that they wanted outdoor learning, but it shouldn't be right next to a playground. So this is one of the areas where there would be kids with gardens and they can be growing things and doing environmental work. And this is where that bus loop that I talked about earlier comes in. This building is the gym. And if I can move this film just a little bit faster, what you're gonna see is the slanted roof allows for the solar voltaic up at top. So we've got on top of the roof and also out on the parking lot. This now we're walking into the building. We're coming past the offices where the principal wanted her office right where she can greet the kids. And you're going to see blank walls here, color schemes that are still we can be choosing them where there can be potential murals by the kids. Um, we can have public art as we swirl around the gymnasium is on this side. And one of the things about the emphasis on daylight, and I observed in a gymnasium like this, is you don't have to turn on the electric lights on if it's a bright day out. There's enough light coming in. This is the cafetorium, which will has a stage, and it's attached in the back. There's going to be a back entrance to the music rooms. The musicians can come out and use the stage as another part of their classroom. So there's been an emphasis on flexibility of the building. This is the upstairs, and this could be the upstairs of the second floor or the third floor, because the way these project areas are set up are similar, um, which also allows for flexibility. There's lockers for the kids here, and all of this brown area is storage area for the teachers, for papers, for extra supplies. And these, the furniture has not been picked, but this is where the small group can be gathered and they can come in and out of the classroom and they can go across the hallway. This is what a classroom will look like. Each of the teachers will have an opportunity to say exactly where do they want their whiteboard? Where do they want their storage area? There are, we're required to have sinks in every room. So the rooms themselves can be project areas. And this is how it would look where the opposing on the other side of a grade. So if you can imagine fourth grade and fifth grade on the top floor where they get to be the big kids looking at out, um, they can be working together. And the principal said she's so excited because the opportunities for collaboration that haven't been there before are in this building. Now we're whirling through the library. And one of the things about the library, the way it's been designed, um, I probably use the word flexible too often, but all of those bookcases move, the ones that aren't attached to the wall. So you can recon reconfigure like you want to have a small learning space, bring some kids in. And I was in a library that had this and I could, I'm not very big, I could move the bookcases. So it wasn't that you had to call uh, for help. So that is the 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 quick tour around um, the building. And uh, um, this can be made available to whoever wants to see it again, because I want to get to any questions and also a discussion. I've listed here, we said, what what's the benefit for our kids. And this is just a laundry list of what, why we think this is so exciting. And this thing about natural daylight, it says uh, test scores, but it also mental health, the way kids feel about the space they're in if they have daylight. They're connected to the out of doors when they can see outside. And several of the building committee members said, don't make the windows start too high. Remember, these kids are short. We want to have them be able to look out of the window, not just know that there's a window up there. The design and the layout is supporting a dual language program that's quite innovative in the way it's teaching. Special education, English language learner, the specialties are distributed across the layout in a way that um, integrates them, but also gives them uh one-on-one -on -one space. And I've mentioned the outdoor learning space is quite expansive. There's trail systems out there and they can really be doing plants. And um, the one thing I can say about and trying to learn about net zero schools, I saw a film from Virginia of a school where the kids were so excited about the school and this was elementary. They went home and were talking to their parents about it. 
And the parents, uh, I've told this story, if you've heard me say it, that parents were saying they go around the house and they're unplugging things all the time and turning off lights because they're used to energy consumption. And then they talk about what the sun did today. So it really is, is, is it's living um, climate action. We're going to own these photovoltaics. So we expect that we will not get much of a utility bill at all. It will either be zero or near zero. And that's estimated to save at least $250,000 a year in utility in uh, gas, oil, electricity compared to the two schools we're now operating. It's also reducing emissions. And ECAC, our Energy Climate Action Group, is doing an estimate on that. It's going to be a significant drop in emissions in town by moving away from these two schools. Because we're using geothermal, the utility company Eversource is giving us an incentive, a rebate of 1.6 million, which brings this whole system very near what it would have cost if we built a conventional heating system off of fossil fuels. So it's been pretty exciting that this has come. And now there are new federal tax credits, both for solar and geothermal. Because of COVID and what's been happening to the construction industry, it's a lot more expensive to build to build pretty much anything these days, um, as we know from our North Amherst library, whose costs went from, I think, 800000 to $2 million over a few years of an estimate in terms of what it would it cost. The MSBA's facility grant is estimated to give us about 40%, leaving us with a share of around $58 million, a little less than $58 million. We are planning on financing most of that with a debt exclusion. We have done a lot of work on bringing that total cost down before we get to what already looks like a high cost by both um, advocating at our legislative level and also our level for MSBA to increase the reimbursement and also being cost conscious. But we need, because of the cost of it, is to go out to the taxpayers to do a debt exclusion, which is an increase in tax just for this project. It's not a general increase. It's not an override. We, the council will need to act to authorize the debt to fund the project on, and that's scheduled for May 3rd. And then it's going out for uh, the debt exclusion vote. And Lynn can remind me after I roll through this, uh, there will be mail ballots. There will be early voting um, in addition to that day. Kathy, isn't it May 2nd? May 2nd, did I? Yeah, May 2nd is the day of the vote. Sorry. May 2nd is the vote, but early voting is going to come the week before that. And the mail ballots are going to go out the first week in April. Lynn, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so, correct. Yeah. So April 3rd is the date that the council will be voting on uh, the, the authorizing the piece. We've begun those discussions, if anyone listened to the council last night. And then the, the vote, and that's a majority vote. Of, uh, we need a two thirds vote at the council, but it's a majority vote of residents. To bring the debt exclusion and the impact down, um, we will be counting on the utility rebates and through Tony and two other people, citizens, residents uh, work. We secured $700,000 to partially pay for the restoration of the community fields. There has been a tentative decision just out of the finance committee so far to appropriate, allocate $5 million of capitalization stabilization funds, so funded out of our cash capital, um, meaning that we'll have about $50 million to fund through the debt exclusion. This calculator that I'm showing you right now does not include that five million from the stabilization fund. Sean is waiting, our finance director, until there's a final decision on that. Right now, it's been recommended by finance, but it's still under discussion. The average increase with this calculator will be a little under $500 for the median home. But we're putting up, and the, Sean has been actively working an ability for everyone to plug in their own address and say, what does it mean for me? And so once we get how we're financing this up, we're going to be able to have everyone do this. I've been whirling through these dates, but the big date to remember right now is May 2nd, 
Um, we get the official word from MSBA at the end of April, but we're already getting unofficially from them exactly where they're going. And they have totally approved our square footage. They've totally approved the layout of classrooms. That was that word just came in today. Um, so we are good to go as far as they're concerned. And if all goes well, the school will open in August. And I'm going to close there. Um, just with these, it's education first, that's been the focus. It's climate action for the town, for our kids. It's a new community resource. And there, the focus on costs is replacing these two buildings. We estimate that we're going to get an operating budget savings of utility plus more and avoiding as much as $40 million for each of the schools in terms of their needing repairs and upgrades um, and and more so because they they have hazardous waste that has to be abated in them. It, they, are, they are needing a lot of money put in them. So we're avoiding costs by moving forward. And I'm gonna end there, but I, I wanna tell everybody, if you don't know it, there are two places you can go right now. The amherst-school-project.com website has a vastly expanded frequently asked questions with answers. And we collected them along the way as people were asking us questions. So if anytime in these meetings, we've heard something, we've tried to respond to, why did we choose Fort River? you know, explain to me more about the energy and the efficiency of the building. And the town staff has just put up this debt exclusion calculator um, that uh, Sean will need to be revising once we make a decision about the amount of the $5 million or other amount, because that will change the calculation. But right now there is a calculator up on the website and I am open for questions. And just before that, I'm going to um, ask if you've just come in and you'd like to be brought into the room, just use the raise hand function and we'll bring you into the room. And also feel free to stay as an attendee if you'd like. And I think if everyone, I want to leave this up for maybe a minute more if people want to write those because I, I whirlwind through this. I will also be putting this chart pack up now that we've done community reservation and the the issue with the chart pack is I cannot put the video up because the file is way too big. So it will be, you'll have to imagine the video <laughs> if you want to download these charts to see them again. So I think I'm going to stop sharing at this point unless, um, and I can always go back to a point if you need to. So returning to the room. Yeah, so this is Meg is, Meg is like, how fast can Kathy talk without trying to talk too fast? So hopefully I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't feel like a freight train just went through, <laughs> just went through you all. But um, really any kind of questions um, between uh, Lynn, who's been through several of these. And if we don't know the answer, we, I promise we'll say we don't know and we'll get back to you. So uh, you can raise your hand uh, in. And you can raise your hand like this. You can raise your hand hitting the emotional button any way you want to indicate that you would like to participate. There's a, a funny new function. If you raise your hand, sometimes it recognizes that you're raising your hand and <laughs> raises it. Very good. So, so Ludmilla's hand went up. And I, I think- I, I Very quickly. Um, when I was listening, I just didn't hear quite what was the term of the debt. So if we're going to accept um, vote for the increase, annual increase in taxes, how long will it take for us to pay off the debt? Right. I think right now um, we're looking to spread it out over time because it's less of an impact in each year. So we're in the 20 to 30 year term. So um, when I say the word temporary, Ludmila, people go, yeah, that's my lifetime. <laughs> but but it's um, because of the way it will be structured, to the extent we got, A, if the project came in under budget, and we have a lot of contingencies meant to us, we wouldn't need to take on as much. So we'll know that when we go out to bid in 2024. 
if we get money along the way, we'll have um, an ability to do early payoff of the debt. It's going to be structured in a way that we can pay down the principal. So we we can be adjusting it along the way if other resources. But yes, it's it's long term debt. It's not it's and not. One other, yeah. One other point is you can always restructure debt if uh, interest rates go down. Yeah. No. Good. I was listening to the presentation with my husband and he of course said, we could have done this how many years ago? <laughs> it's just really hard to watch this wonderful presentation, which I really support and I will support the school um, vote because uh, I will vote yes on the elementary school because I think it's absolutely necessary. We have waited far too long. Thank you. and. You know, it, it does feel like we're on the brink of a big opportunity. And so we need to seize it um, You know, when you said we've been waiting. Yeah. Yeah, not, not to speak of, you know, changes and cost uh, growth. And um, maybe you could speak a little bit to the benefits to the by the educational program that can be met here in the new school. Um, so one of the, um, you know, ten Tamara, who is the principal of Fort River, says this better than I do, but one of the things they've looked at is because of the configuration of the spaces with these small breakout spaces and places to be able to do individual one-on-one, -on -one, and it will be quiet. Um, they did a, they, we took several teachers on tours of two or three schools that have been written built in the last few years and what they came away the first impression was it wasn't noisy um that they're they're used to being in the midst of noise and then they were seeing where if you needed to take a few kids and work just with those kids that the opportunities to do that both indoors and outdoors are huge the way um tony probably knows the company Comenantes program better than I do, although I don't think you have a child in it, but Comenantes is the, our dual language program where people are partially in English, partially in Spanish, but you can choose to be English only. There, it's it's, it's a, a team effort and those classrooms can be clustered near each other and across the fourth graders across from the fifth graders. So it it's supportive of that idea of language immersion, but also being part of the whole school. The special needs classrooms are distributed around the floors, but also the classrooms so that they can be integrated, but also if they need help with reading or help with English as a second language, um, there's a play, there's a breakout space to go for it. And, and I, I guess the other, the really big one um, is the daylight in the classrooms. I mean, really trying to think of um, what that does for mental health, for uh, the way kids learn and work with each other. Um, so it, it, the teachers have emphasized that they see all these opportunities for collaboration that they have not had because of the way this the space is, but has been much more rigid. I see Nancy's hand is raised. Um, I also wanted to, again, because we have some new folks in the audience, if you'd like to be brought in, please go ahead and raise your hand and we'll move you over. And I saw that Nancy's hand was raised. Well, uh, I just, yeah, but about the noise, um, it looked to me like the dividers between the project areas and the classrooms were open, you know, above the, above a certain barrier level. Uh, wouldn't that allow noise to sort of travel into all of those they, they're they're pretty small in the two schools. Uh, I hadn't seen this kind of design before, Nancy. And the two schools I went, there were only a few kids out there, and there's acoustical tiles all over. So that they they're usually out there working on a project. They're not out there, um, you know, they're out they're building something with their hands, or they're out there reading. Um, so it's one of the, I think the uh, learning experience for teachers will be how to use these spaces well. Um, so the the one school that this designer built when we went to visit um, and I saw a teacher and I said, how is this working? She said, it's fabulous. We just wish we had more of those small spaces. 
<laughs> so she said, as many as we have, we wish we had more. Um, so I, I think they've found ways to incorporate them um, into their curriculum. <clears throat> Meg, I see your hand is raised. Okay. Uh, oh, I'm not muted. Oh, I wonder if I, um, I think I wanted to say the obvious, which is to thank Kathy for extraordinary leadership in a hard time uh, with a lot of different opinions and having created this amazing project. So I, I don't have, it's obvious to say, but still important to say, thank you, dear leader. And that's all, except that I think Nancy's question was a little bit not quite Nancy was talking about the project areas, but aren't the classrooms separate from the project? Yeah, the, the classrooms aren't, you know, Nancy, I, I thought I understood you on the outside areas. The classrooms have a door and those they're not, you know, except when you open your door, you're not. It's not, yeah. So the projects are when you're out in that space between the classrooms, but they're barriers, but the actual classrooms are quiet. They, and the classrooms, have, the walls of the classrooms go all the way up to the ceiling. Yeah, yeah that okay. what you the light you saw up there, those okay. were windows. Those were windows. I should okay. have been very, it wasn't that you had just a half of a wall. You have a wall all the way up to the top. So I'm sorry I didn't if I didn't understand it. Yeah. No, it was confused. We went it was so quick that I but I sort of heard what Nancy was asking and remembered that. Thank you. Yeah. But Thank bravo, you. Kathy. Bravo. Yeah. Bravissima. But, you know, I have to say, you know, District we, one. I mean, no, you're great to give me credit, but we, we've had a design team that's been so responsive when people would, would uh, you know, the outdoor learning was an example. They were clustering it near the playgrounds and two of the teachers said, you can't do that. We can't do, we can't bring a classroom outside and be teaching something and having kids jump up and down on a, on a swing at the same time. You know, we need to keep them a bit separate. And so they said, oh, okay, well, we'll move, you know, we'll think of where we locate it. And then a lot of work with teachers on the layout of the classroom. You know, where do you want this? Where do you want that? Um, including administrative staff where they said, no, 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 no. We need, we need to be able to see each other. We work as a team, you know, so that, that moving around on, I was very impressed and that was not me. I, I don't design things. Um, I moved into an old house and we kept it just the way it is. <laughs> but you know how to bring people, you bring the right people together. And yeah. Then, then sit back. So Steve. Yeah. Um, thanks. Um, I really like the looks of that plan a lot. Thank you. I, uh, my question, it may be a de detail at this stage, but Kathy, you said that we, the town owns the photovoltaics. I just wonder, is there any sense of what their lifespan is? Um, the answer is I should know that question, answer to that question, because we have it on multiple charts. But um, uh, so I know with my own, it's it's 20 years, but I have to come back to you, Steve, you know, and the the panels themselves, the way they'll be attached, um, Ludmilla and some others may know the answer, but they're easy to replace. You know, it's not a redoing the whole system. The geothermal system has is is longer than the lifespan of the building. The actual wells that go in, um, but clearly, you know, it's it's not. They're not be there forever. The importance of owning them is that we get every kilowatt hour of energy credit goes on to us rather than to sharing sharing it with it, and and that will mean that we are. Um, we're paying back this investment, particularly with these new federal tax credits, really fast um, while saving money every year. So it's a nice combination. I, I can just chime in to say that most of them are 20 to 30 and 40 years plus. I, 20 years ago, I saw some panels that were installed in the 50s and 60s and they were still functioning. So even though the warranty might be only for the first 20 years, they can go quite long as long as we don't as long as we keep them clean okay, same. thank you there's it steve did that answer your question yeah nancy sorry yeah, i i just want to echo everyone of this is just an amazing uh, piece of work 
that um, and and the attention to education and whatever it's the kind of thing that makes me really proud to be live in Amherst. But I'm also feeling just a tad bit of a disconnect when I know uh, I have three teachers who are I have three neighbors who are teachers, and I know that the people who are going to be occupying this beautiful building and really performing for us are not happy campers in town. And, and I would just like to just remind us that it also takes people power to do this. And, you know, it's, I, I'm 100% behind this. this. Um, I'm just saying it, that there's a, um, I hope that we can continue to do, to continue to value education at this level. And thank you, Kathy, and the team, and whatever. This is just, and it's and the transparency and the whatever. I just, it's it's a real pleasure to um, be in District One and have you guys as our representatives. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. So I saw Jamila and then Marcus. Oh, I, I won't go long. I just wanted to echo all the other words about how hard it is to be on a building committee, how many difficult decisions the committee probably has made to get this far. I think the sooner we make this investment and get our students and our teachers in a building that is healthy, the better. Um, and then the rest will follow in some ways. I mean, we've waited a very long time for this. There should be absolutely no indecision to support it now. And I think it will definitely improve the condition of the teachers and we'll be able to focus on operational issues. What do we do with the existing buildings? How do we improve the quality of education from elementary through the high school? What do we do with the middle school? I mean, do you know any, do you have any information about the swing space, about the use of existing buildings and what the future will bring in terms of those assets then coming back to us so that we can offset some of the investment made in the new building? Um, just a quick response in that the answer is no, there's not an immediate plan, but if this goes, if the May 2nd vote happens and we know, you know, there, it's a two-step, the school district would have to say, we don't want Wildwood anymore. You know, we're giving you, it's a, it's a, it's a surplus building as far as we're concerned. But then we have quite a bit of time where we could start saying, what could it be, including um, uh, a return in value to us? So it's, there's, not, there's no prejudgment right now. We have more than one of those. We still have the South Amherst School. <laughs> so, and, and I think for me, the lesson of the South Amherst School is we locked the door and haven't used it other than storage. And when we tried to open the door, we decided, uh oh, it's not good to leave it sitting there that long, you know, in terms of being able to use it. So we we will be turning pretty quickly to that discussion once we know that we we face this opportunity. It's a it's turning what might be a liability into an asset is I think what we're we're going to be talking about. Lynn, do you want good to add? Luck and thank you. No, good luck and thank you so much for doing the work, volunteering. Marcus. And then I think Janet's hand is up also. Yeah. Hi, actually, this is Laura Drocker um, listening in with Marcus. <clears throat> um, thank you, Kathy, for the presentation and everything you've done. Um, and yeah, fully support the school and really hoping that um, we have a successful vote on the second. I just want to say that I think all of us also really support our educators and I and you know I think this school building will support them in many ways. I also think that the best way for us to support our educators is to continue to ask and pressure our state legislature, let our state to give us the funding we deserve for our public education to continue to press for federal funding to support public education and to continue to pr press our higher ed institutions to pay their fair share into our town. Um, we can sit and fight each other <laughs> over the little bit of money we have, or we can try to expand the pot. And so I just wanna, I know that Kathy and Lynn and Michelle can't say that. So I wanted to come on and say that I think that's where we need to be focusing our effort um, and getting this new school will be, you know, 
a step in the right direction. So thank you all. And 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 Laura, we totally agree with it. So we we can say that. And Lynn has been testifying to that effect. But yes, <laughs> yes. Um, uh, Janet Keller has her hand up. Janet, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, so good to be here with you on this occasion um, when we're nearing the finish line on this wonderful project. And um, I support uh, the uh, all that others have said, and I won't repeat all the, the thanks. And um, uh, I will uh, say I, re I greatly appreciate um, hearing about and experiencing the inclusiveness of this project and the collaboration among all the parties. I, I um, am especially impressed by that. And I um, want to say that I fully support um, this school and will uh, pass the word and make sure that my friends uh, know that and hopefully motivate them to to uh, make their feelings known um, and I do like the um, expand the pot suggestion for supporting our, our uh, educators and I know you you do too so um, thanks again for that thanks Janet Um, Kath, if it's okay with yes, you. I, I think we can, if I'm not seeing any other hands, so I think we can move to the next, Michelle. And again, if anyone, I think all of you know my email, if anyone wants the set of charts or for the, the large co-housing group, if you want to do, have a presentation there, Lynn and I are going out to the extent we can. We want to make sure that people know what what the project is it, rather than just read about it in the newspaper so so we're we're willing to travel and we are traveling so so yours it's all yours michelle well i'm actually first just want to also publicly acknowledge lynn for being at all of these meetings and everything that you do lynn so thank you you really hold a lot um, for for the council and the community. Um, but I would like to go out of order because we have our wonderful crest director, Earl Miller here, and he's here at 745 on a Tuesday night, um, which just says the world about him. Um, I, I actually could use like five minutes. You so want you okay, thing to do. I, I have my kid with me, so it seems like she needs me. So if you got time to burn, I'm, I'm okay with it. Thank you. All right. Fair enough. Then I will move in um, to just a little uh, a little bit about the reparations work. And then we'll, um, whenever Earl is ready, we'll, we'll go, we'll move to Earl. Um, so reparations. Well, we are, um, the, the African Heritage Reparation Assembly is nearing completion of our work. Um, our charge is completed in June. Um, so we are right now in a consultative process with the community. And so we are hosting listening sessions. Um, some of you have attended those. Um, and we are also developing a, a big piece of our work in the moment is to develop a survey with the Dunahue Institute. Um, the survey will be uh, set for release at the end of March, and it will be made available to all community members and stakeholders. Um, so really encourage you all when that comes out to uh, where we're trying to make it I know there's a lot of surveys that go out in our community. Um, so we're certainly trying to, to make it um, accessible and um, to not take too long, but we would love for, your, for you to, to, to take it and to pass it on to folks in the community who may be interested in providing input. 
Um, all of these things, the listening sessions, the surveys, um, all of the input that we're receiving is really going to inform how we design the plan that we will recommend to the town council. Um, so every voice matters um, and we really want to hear from, from everybody. Um, and uh, I wanted to announce uh, an exciting event that's coming up. And this is where I'm going to share screen, Kath. If I think I should have the ability to do that. Um, it just... doesn't seem to be restricted, Michelle. Okay, so perfect. Not... All right. Let me try. Um, can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, hold on. Let me see. I got weird stuff in the back. So is the, the when you share your screen, you got to remember, um, I've got like 20 windows open, but here we go. Um, so we are hosting an, uh, a town hall event, uh, building and sustaining a local reparations movement. This is happening next Thursday, March 30th at the Powerhouse at Amherst College. Um, we are uh, hosting this in partnership with the Association of Amherst Students, which is essentially the Amherst College Student Senate. And uh, former Alderwoman uh, Robin Rue Simmons, who led the country's first ever reparations effort, is joining us for this really special event. So um, we'll begin the event with some opening remarks from folks at the college, and then we will be watching a, a, a screening of The Big Payback, which is a documentary that um, follows Robin's journey um, as she began working on reparations in Evanston and all the way through um, into, into uh, more just this past year. Um, Dr. Amakar Shabazz and I have a small part in the film, so that <laughs> very, very small part, you might even miss it, um, but that's exciting. And um, after that, we'll be having a discussion with Robin um, and the assembly, as well as Mike Jerick, who is the Racial History of Amherst College Research Fellow. Um, so this is open to the public, um, doors open at 545, it is free. Um, and uh, if you can't attend in person, um, we will be live streaming and recording the opening remarks as well as the discussion. We unfortunately can't live stream the actual uh, film, but we'll have instructions for how you could pop over to PBS um, and watch it for free from your own device. Um, so, but we we really welcome you to come and and join us for this special event. We're really excited to have Robin join us. Um, let me just see here. Oh, wait a second. I didn't mean to do that. I meant to stop my share. Okay, here we go. <laughs> um, so the plan is to provide recommendations in a full report to the town council in June. And um, as many of you may know, the town council um, committed to $2 million over 10 years um, that um, we are just, uh, it's just been a wonderful commitment by the town. And we do hope to increase that fund in other ways um, that the, that the assembly is exploring. So that's, that's, I'll stop there and see if there are any questions or comments. Meg, are you raising your hand? Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Um, could you say a little more about what, how you're developing a plan for spending the funding? Yeah, that's that's what we're really in the process of figuring out right now, Meg. So based on what we receive back in the survey, based on the listening sessions, based on the legal advice, kind of everything, um, I think there will be uh, there will be sort of a multifaceted approach. Um, we've heard a lot uh, so far, but, uh, you know, certain themes like education continue to arise. Um, and we're even hearing that just in the context of this discussion. Um, so we don't, that, that, that hasn't been fully um, fleshed out yet, but that's what we're in the process of working on. Thank you. 
Yeah, absolutely. And when that survey comes out, um, in fact, Meg, I'll be emailing you <laughs> tomorrow about something related to the survey. We're looking for for one or two people to um, to beta test it for us. So thought of you. Um, <laughs> you don't have to, no pressure. <laughs> uh, any other questions or comments? How, how does the, I know the survey, does the survey, how, how does the public uh, contribute thoughts about how the funding might be spent? The survey is an excellent way to do that. Um, and you can provide responses. It's in a Qualtrics. Um, you'll be able to provide responses anonymously. Um, you could also, of course, send an email um, to myself as the chair. Um, and and all of that will be incorporated. But I would say uh, coming coming to the meetings, you know, depending on whether you want to voice your um, voice yourself publicly or privately, um, you could do so in, in either way. Thanks. Absolutely. Well, I think most of you know how to reach me um, and please feel free to reach out anytime um, if you have questions or concerns or comments. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to you now, Earl, if you're ready. <laughs> I am ready, thank you for that. Right. Um, awesome. <laughs> all right, so uh, actually I'm, I'm, so I'm Earl Miller. I'm the director of the Community Responders for Equity, Safety and Service, your new, uh, I don't know if new, it, it's been about a year, so I don't know if it's still new, but it feels new, so I'll say it, um, Public Safety Department. Um, today is actually my one year anniversary with the town, so I'm really excited to spend it with you all and um, kind of my hope was just to kind of walk you through what the year has been like, um, so you can, I think last time I spoke with this group, it was all still very hypothetical. Uh, we were in the middle of hiring folks that I really hoped we were going to get eight. I uh, wasn't sure there for a minute. Uh, we did. Um, so last year I started and really uh, thanks to the counselors, we this thing even happened, right? Um, you know, uh, just reminding folks that this comes out of that post-George Floyd conversation. And a lot of communities started the conversation about something different from existing public safety. And almost all of them gave up. Um, and if you ever get the chance, you're looking for riveting viewing, I encourage folks to watch the CSWG meetings and the town council meetings from around that time. Um, it took a lot of eagle swallowing. It took a lot of uh, ability to hear hard, hard things about a place that folks feel a real fondness for. Um, and sometimes it got really personal and it would have been very easy for anybody at any point to have put the brakes down and stopped it. And I wouldn't be here. Uh, we wouldn't be talking about this thing. And, and that was the easiest, the easiest end of this thing is for the conversation to start and die out. Um, we're one of only 40 communities in the country that has anything like this. Um, so I hope this is another thing folks can feel proud about. So I came in uh, kind of with a very, very uh, aspirational uh, mission statement, uh, thanks to the town council, um, enough resources to get it done. Um, and then I had to figure it out. So we started doing engagement events in the community uh, of the eight responders, and we did get all eight responders. Um, six of them were recruited from public events. Um, Meg, actually one of my favorite responders, uh, Kevon Lord came from the League of Women Voters event. Uh, that we did over the summer on that 110 degree day. I uh, wasn't sure I was going to make it. wasn't sure any of us were going to make it. The water park broke down. Yeah, um, the water park broke. <laughs> but we got Kavon and he, he was worth it all. Um, really, really wonderful, wonderful get for the town. Um, so uh, I started on March 21st. Uh, by July 5th, we had identified all of the responders. We had hired them, onboarded them. Uh, I just want to note how big of a deal that is. Um, so Northampton has joined us in this effort, and um, it is hard. Um, they have uh, made very good faith efforts to hire folks, um, and their second director started today, um, and we'll start the work of hiring a team. These things err towards failure at that point. Hiring the team is a really hard part, um, but it actually wasn't that hard in Amherst. Um, of the 10 people who work on our team, um, eight of them had already been in Amherst before I got there. They had gone to school there. They lived there. Um, they, they had some contact with the town. They'd worked there. Um, so these were folks who had already been incubated in our community. Um, so we hired these folks um, who were very brave. 
they applied to a job that didn't exist before them. Um, that was very much a kind of gut feeling on my part and a gut feeling on the council and um, some commitments from some folks who could have really thrown down some speed bumps. Um, so I just want to applaud their bravery. Um, I did it myself, but I had a little bit more of a cushy thing. I, I, I had a feeling that if this if things didn't work out, I'd be all right. I could probably go back to the state. But these were brave young folks who joined us. Um, we did nine weeks of training, um, and I'm not going to talk too much about the training uh, because this summer we're going to we're, we're aiming to run kind of a mini Crest Academy for folks in town. So I hope to give you all a chance to experience a little bit of that training. Um, the core modality was motivational interviewing, um, which is a mental health framework really based in asking open ended questions, not just to deescalate conflicts, but actually to help get to the root of the issue. Um, we got uh, we had a police officer from the police academy come and teach us situational awareness. We had firefighters teach us how to uh, do first aid and defibrillators and all of that. Um, we had uh, faculty from every college in town come and teach us things on restorative justice and, and kind of social justice practices. Um, some of you might have seen us in your community. Uh, we had Bill Laramie drive us around in the fire van. Bill Laramie, the community participate, uh, community safety officer from the police department, uh, drive us around and show us the neighborhoods and what were the particular issues. Um, uh, responders walked the trails. They did everything they could to kind of get a touch. We went with conservation. Uh, we looked for where unhoused folks might be uh, so we could plan on how to meet them. It was a really ni intensive nine weeks. I have to be honest. I made it stressful on purpose because um, that was my job, um, but they all they all came through it. That's another really impressive point for the town. Uh, eight people went into training, seven people came out. That is a really, really impressive number. Um, you you have other, when, when I talked to folks in Denver, they carried about 40% of their folks out of training. Um, the training is hard. You're, you're talking about dealing with people on the worst day of their lives without a weapon or a fire truck, um, which can be scary. Um, we went live on September 6th, um, which makes us the fastest department in the country uh, from the council declaring that we should start to us going live. It was nine months. Um, these things average about three to four years. Um, the fastest uh, other than us we can find is about two years and two months. Um, we, we moved as quickly as we could. Part of the reason we were able to move quickly is because you all had had such hard conversations. We didn't have to really deal with the philosophical stuff. We knew that Amherst demanded that we would be bold. Um, they demanded that we would be a public safety department, which meant we needed to go wherever the trouble was. Uh, we needed to not be afraid of that. Um, and the really great part is you put our expectation right in the name, right? Equity, safety, and service. So you didn't, you didn't hide it from us, which was really nice of you. Um, our team is uh, seven of our 10 responders are folks of color. Um, we recognize that this was a diversity initiative, and there are lots of ways we could have achieved that. Um, one way we tried to achieve that was by um, looking at what public safety used to look like and kind of how you identified police before everything got so formalized. And what you looked for was a type of person. You looked for the type of person you wouldn't mind looking across your own kitchen table at. Um, every responder we have, I think you wouldn't mind looking across your own kitchen table at them. Uh, they are kind folks. Um, I'm the old man of the department. I just turned 37. So we do, we are a little bit of a, a younger department. Um, we have a uh, Rome Cabrera, who's a Spanish speaker, um, families from Ecuador. Uh, we have Kevon Lord, who I think you all probably know Heather Lord, uh, his aunt, who uh, represents a big figure in town, Kenneth Michael Q, um, who is uh, kind of a magician. I, I don't exactly know how he does it, but is one of the most friendly people you'll ever meet and has a real ability to get people in challenging moments to open up a little bit. Um, you will often find him if you drive by the bank center during the day, kind of holding court with unhoused folks outside, trying to help them connect with things that might make sense. Uh, we have Vanessa Phillips, a mother in this town, who has uh, kids at Crocker Farm in uh, Fort River, um, Wildwood, I mean, and uh, we have uh, Brittany Houghton, who was a uh, uh, college, uh, who worked at uh, Western New England in residence life, which was important. Uh, we have Tim DeRocher, who is, uh, I promise you, this is a good thing, uh, a current UMass student. Um, it has really brought a lot to bear with us understanding what happens on that campus and how it works. Um, we have uh, Chalo, uh, who is a, uh, a young man who grew up in this town. He uh, kicked for the football team about 10 years ago. Um, grew up in Kenya, uh, still goes back there. We'll be leaving in 18 days, and, and boy, will I miss him um, until he comes back. Um, speak Swahili. 
I was actually running a series of events at Crocker Farm. Um, right now, they're doing uh, drum circles, uh, an African dance. Uh, they'll be doing a coding workshop after that. Um, and next year, we hope to make that a full year experience for, for the community, um, which, which we're excited for. Uh, I'm trying to make sure I'm not missing anyone. Oh, and and uh, uh, one of my favorite, uh, Tia Atwell, who is our youngest responder. Uh, she is she will turn 21 here soon. Um, got sworn in, was our first responder to get sworn in alongside police officers and firefighters, which was a big deal for us. Um, a young woman who has uh, more energy than I could imagine ever having. Um, but if you you will often find her. Uh, she, today, she took uh, several seniors in our town grocery shopping. Um, she's pretty good at that. I, I guess she's got a, a keen eye for couponing, which is not something I do, but is, is important these days. Um, and then Kat Newman, who is really my right hand in things, uh, ran the COVID ambassador program uh, out of the police department before Crest. Um, and just you won't find a person who cares more about doing it the right way um, than her. And then me, I'm I, I got lucky. I, I got lucky with these folks. Um, uh, I, 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 you know, I, I'm lucky. I'm, I'm really glad to be here. So we've been operating since September. Uh, we've had uh, the number I looked at last week was about 5,500 engagements with our neighbors. Um, we run, uh, if you get food from the uh, senior center, we are often doing those routes as a way to meet seniors in a kind of non-pressured situation. Um, we work with the survival center. Um, for some folks who struggle with some behavior issues that might make delivering groceries hard, we take those on uh, to make sure that they can still get their resources and we get to meet them uh, before things are too hard. Uh, we uh, get calls from folks all around the community, largely businesses or folks who identify someone in their, their neighborhood they're worried about. Um, we do a fair amount of wellness checks. That we're probably closing in on about a thousand wellness checks since we started. Um, and those are, are really just, you know, it, it doesn't look like what I think folks traditionally have seen wellness checks look like. Um, hey, we're not cops, um, which is good and bad. If you want a cop and we show up, you're going to be disappointed. Um, but if you don't, then you might not. Um, but really, it's it's to just see how someone's doing. R really is just, how are you doing? And is there a need we can help you to meet? And sometimes that need is just a person to listen, um, particularly for the seniors in this town. I'm acutely aware of the, the loneliness that COVID brought on and that that has not been addressed for folks. There are a lot of folks in our town who are still very concerned, rightly so, about COVID um, and are struggling to get out of their homes. So we we engage with those folks. Um, we've talked to folks who screen doors if that made them feel safer. Um, and we talk to some folks on the phone just about every day. Um, we we care a whole lot about folks. And I, I know that that is not necessarily a thing that um, you expect from government, but uh, I think the gap we really fill in is that behavioral health. Um, we do human, we do uh, a meeting with other human service agencies in the area uh, every other month. Uh, we collaborate with anybody who will collaborate with us. Uh, similarly to my policy, of if I'm invited to a place, I'll show up. Yeah, I was invited here. I showed up. Uh, so I'll check that off the list. Um, you know, the responders, if we're called to a place, we will do our best to go. Um, I want to think of some. Oh, so I'll give you my three uh, biggest success stories of the moment. And if you ask me next week, it may be a different list. But these are the things that feel most important for me today. Um, one is the MOU with the schools. Um, for us to do the work that we intend to do, the work around kind of reducing the impact of trauma in our community, it is vitally important that we're able to provide resources to, um, to families in our town who are struggling, not just to make ends meet, but to socialize. I'm a parent of a, a young kid. I have a 12 year old running around here somewhere, hopefully not making too big of a mess. Um, and the pandemic taught me one thing, I'm no good as a teacher. Um, it's, it's not my thing. Uh, and so, our, our work with the schools often actually looks like supporting the parents. The schools do a wonderful job of supporting the students. Um, but as we hear from like uh, principals like Derek Shea, uh, the issue is when the bus drops the kid off, then life keeps happening. And so sometimes families don't have anybody to respond to. Um, currently, we have uh, a young uh, Afghani family who was separated. Uh, the father's in Pakistan currently, the mother's in our community, um, and was struggling to get our kid to school. Um, and so we provide uh, out of the five days the kid goes to school, we provide uh, nine of the rides uh, back and forth to school. Um, and it allows us to engage with the family. It allows us to address a core need. 
But most importantly, I think it shows that Amherst cares about the person. We are town employees who are willing to, you know, our responders really look forward to it now. Uh, we like the young man a great deal. Um, but it also shows the family that the town cares. Um, second, I would say is uh, when the, the recent cold snap, I, I know we had like all of winter in about 30 days. Uh, but if you remember at the beginning of it, there were some really cold days. Um, we were able to get nine people in the shelters, including three folks who had been unsheltered for oh, two plus years. Um, and the way we did it was a very slow process. Um, the one I'm most proud of is a young man who was sleeping in front of some businesses. Um, it took us 10 attempts to get him to engage with us. Um, and I'm glad we made all 10 of them because it was the relationship building that happened along the way that got us there. Um, and someone who, when we first met him, was uninterested in housing ever. Um, we are now working on permanent housing uh, with this person uh, because they have a trust for us. Uh, that matters to me. Uh, and third, um, I would say is our, our work as constables. If folks voted uh, back in the last election, uh, you might not have noticed because we were sitting in the background, but at most precincts, there wasn't a police officer there. Um, that's because every responder and Cat Newman all served as constables on that day. And I'll tell you, the police department was actually pretty grateful. Um, if you working constable stuff means you got to get up at about four o'clock in the morning, you got to report to the town clerk at 530, you got to start moving stuff around. So those folks didn't have to come in extra early. I know Gabe King particularly appreciated it. Um, but it also meant for our folks that they got to be kind of with folks on an important day. And on the next election, you will find us in the same spaces. Uh, we continue to work with the town clerk on those things. Um, yeah, so I, I really do hope ultimately that Crest is something everybody here gets to feel really proud of. This doesn't happen if we don't have uh, residents who are interested in, in things being different, not just for different sake, but because different is possible. Uh, this wouldn't be possible if we didn't have elected officials who were committed to doing the things they said they were gonna do. Um, this was a, pro a big promise made. Lots of people made these promises and did not hold them. Um, the folks you're looking at did. Um, at, at sometimes uh, certainly great risk to their ability to get to sleep before midnight. Um, but on other days, you know, it, there were some some really hard things said. Um, and obviously the town manager and every town employee who has been generous with their time, uh, who have been gracious to us, and frankly, um, the most kind group of people I've ever worked with. Um, there isn't anybody who works in town that I couldn't call right now if I needed them and they wouldn't respond to me. Um, and that's been consistent from the moment I got here. Um, this is a good place to work. And that's that's because it's Amherst, right? That's, that's who we are. So um, glad to answer any questions uh, and not just now that is an open invitation uh, as long as you need it. Um, but I'll tell you uh, a year and this is the best job I ever had. Um, I, I work uh, just about every day and and because I want to, because uh, I can't, I can't, I haven't found anything quite as fun as what I'm doing here right now. And I imagine someday maybe I'll get into golf and I'll take some days off. But right now um, I get to do the best work in the world with the least amount of restrictions. I am privileged. Uh, so glad to answer any questions or, or say any, or, or talk about anything folks want to hear. Thank you so much, Earl. Um, I'm just going to, again, invite, uh, there are some new folks in the attendees. Um, we are nearing the, toward the end of our meeting, but if you'd like to be brought in, please raise your hand and we'll bring you in. So I see, Earl, a chat room question came on, if someone wanted your help, how do they reach you? Is there a helpline? Do they call 911? What's the process of finding you if you don't find them? So I, I will say, I know 911 is the big, it's our next big hill to climb. It's going to be here sooner than folks think. Um, my hope is that at some point this summer, uh, you will be able to call us through 911 the same way you call anyone else. Um, currently, uh, you can either email me. Uh, my email is uh, Miller, uh, e at amherstma.gov. Or you can call us uh, at 413-259-3370. Um, and you don't have to remember that. If you go to the town website, uh, you can type in Crest and you can find all that there. Um, the other thing is for lots of folks, these, these are really deeply personal issues that folks are reaching out to us about. Come into the office. Um, if you're not sure if we can help you, just show up anyway. 
Um, and if we can't, we will help you to find where, where you can go. We are the top of the bank center. Uh, it says second floor, but I've walked the building a few times and I'm, I, I can't help but thinking there's four floors there. Um, <laughs> so we are the top floor of the bank center. Um, and actually, even if you just go in an elevator now, they're labeled, you'll find us. Um, our hours are uh, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, Mondays. 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, Tuesday through Friday, uh, and then 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Saturdays. Um, and that, you know, for 10 people, that's probably as far as I can stretch it right now without uh, cloning someone. Uh, but particularly if folks have special events, um, we, we tend to not turn down invitations to things. Um, a good example of that is that we worked Blarney. Uh, we worked kind of uh, you know, we've been to some town council meetings uh, when there's been a need for some extra support. Um, if folks have a particular event where it would make sense to have a crest responder, just reach out to me. And if we can make it work, we will. We haven't said no yet. I'm sure we will someday. Was that a good enough answer? I, I want to make sure. Okay. You, you will get some probably unsatisfying government answers, but I'll try not to. And the numbers advertised on the town website, um, we have given out uh, probably about 2,000 of our engagement chops, which usually have a positive saying on one side and our phone number and address on the other. If you go to any town event, you will find one of those. And, um, and uh, all of our folks have cards, which are now kind of uh, floating around town in a, a bunch of different ways. You know, part of it is we don't want to, we don't want to overwhelm folks, right? Our goal isn't to to be the most known folks, it's to be the help, most helpful for the folks who need us. So I would say folks also hear from us, we've done a lot of work to make sure if you show up at a therapist's office, you'll hear about us. If you show up at the police department and they can't help you, they'll they'll send you our way. And uh, I think, you know, one of our one of our core values is that we don't ask people to trust us. Um, we are trustworthy. And if you watch us, you'll, you'll see that. And I just wanted to read, we have a comment in the chat. Uh, many thanks. I'm so proud of this program. And Earl is a wonderful addition to our town. Um, and Earl, I was just going to clarify that you're, um, of the three things that you said you were most proud of, the MOU with the school, just in case folks didn't know what that was. It's oh, yeah. A Do you want to just say yeah. quickly what that is? so that It's a memorandum of understanding, which sounds like a very flowery thing, but it's a real contract that took real time and real lawyers to figure out. Um, but the goal is that we wanted to make sure that our support at the school was support, that we weren't assuming what the school needed, that we weren't, we weren't usurping their power. Same way we're not trying to replace police. We are not trying to replace teachers. Um, I, like I said, I'm not that good at it. Um, so this was really hard work. I want to thank Mike Morris and the school board um, for asking really, really hard questions and demanding a lot of us, um, but also being fair. You know, they they could have been, uh, you know, I'm, I'm surprised when I talk to other folks in my position across the country, they talk about how much obstruction they face um, and knock on wood, I haven't faced a whole bunch. Um, most folks who, disagree, who who aren't certain about what we do have a really good reason to be uncertain. Mm. And you can find it on the website. If you go through the school board's um, uh, website, you can actually find the MOU uh, in a November meeting. And if anybody wants a copy of it, you can email me and I'll send it out. It, it's, uh, it really does describe that we are not trying to usurp police roles. We're not, um, we're not school resource officers. Our job there is not to provide discipline. Um, our job is to be a resource to the folks who need us. Sometimes that means when a teacher is navigating something, they might, might want to reach out just to get some advice, just to consult with someone. Um, and, and frankly, sometimes just to be mad. Sometimes when you're when you're in one of those schools, things get really complicated and you need somebody to vent who isn't in charge. Um, mm -hmm. We serve that role for folks when they reach out to just a, a, an open ear and another adult. Um, we also have had responders at basketball games at the high school. Some of our responders coach uh, youth basketball for the rec department. Um, so it just allows us to be a resource. Um, I, I will I will acknowledge uh, Ray Harp did convince me to go to the Amherst versus Holyoke football game. I am a native Holyoker and, uh, and we lost. Uh, we won. Amherst won. Uh, it was a tough one, but uh, yeah, so uh, that was my first game here. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Earl. And, and again, thanks for coming on a Tuesday night. We just really, really appreciate it and um, look forward to continuing to speak with you um, as we as we go on um, i would be remiss if i didn't mention we have a listening session this weekend 
um, Saturday from two to four. You can join us in person at town uh, in the town room at town hall, or you can join by room uh, by Zoom. You can find that link on the CSSJC uh, section of the town website. Um, but also, if you have questions, you don't have to wait. If you can't make it, we'll send you the PowerPoint. We'll do the PowerPoint just for you if you need it. Um, small enough town that if you want to know the thing and you can't get there, we'll make sure you, you hear it. Earl, are you doing that? So you're doing that with the CSSJC? Is it a, a collaborative listening session? Okay. Yeah, it's sponsored by the CSSJC, um, and it's really our first effort. Um, I think that the thing I can commit to you all is that there will be a lot of those next year as we really do kind of stand up. We want to make sure that what we're doing continues to to support the needs of folks. Uh, I'll point to Blarney. I heard from folks on Faring Street uh, the entire year that they wanted us to have a presence there. And we had four responders walking up and down that street most of the day. Um, so uh, I do want to say it's not just to listen to you. We, we will be responsive to what we can be. Thank you. And if you all want a really exciting day in the town room on Saturday, <laughs> there is a town council retreat that begins at 8.30 and goes until 1.30. You'll have a short break and then you can go to the listening session. <laughs> um, and it's all available on Zoom. <laughs> that's true. Um, yeah, big day. Opportunity. Um, so I think at this point, we're sort of open for any other um, questions and um, to any other discussion. Would you say, Kath, is that? Yeah, and I think, so. and one of the things we wanted to make sure, um, you know, we don't have a huge group here, so we can repeat this out in the donor newsletter or by email. We pick these topics because they're so topical. You know, we're really, the May 2nd vote is coming up, the reparations is active. But if there are issues that uh, deserve a longer conversation, um, we're happy to host a meeting. I mean, we, we, we are trying not to be meeting intensive if it doesn't seem there's a need for a meeting, <laughs> but we would, and we'd be happy to do it in person. You know, I think we're all looking forward to, this gorgeous North Amherst Library, which is emerging before our eyes, having that community room. But you know, we we can try to do a meeting in person if that would work better. Um, so we're Michelle and I would like to be available and not have us drive the agenda, but also be responsive with agenda. So just to give you an example, when I went to Lynn's District Two meeting. The, we talked mainly about the school and then we quickly went into roads and people oh. were talking, they, people volunteered, my road is worse than your road. Oh, no, 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 you have to come on my road, you know? And there was a, a clamor for like, where's our tax dollars going? You know, the, the roads are a mess. So I think as far as I can see, everybody in town feels they're, their local roads are the worst in Amherst because as they drive around, they they their tires discover. But that just cropped up. And Lynn, I think it's been a repeating theme with you all. But I will, I will tell you, I think Heather Stone wins the prize. <laughs> oh, Heather Stone is awful. Yes. You, you need to be really careful when you drive on it. I even suggested the hearing the other day that I was going to give them a map so that they could see just how bad the roads were and they were going to be routed through Heatherstone. Yeah. And hopefully their car would survive. Yeah, right. So, but 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 you know, to the extent we can convey that this is a concern not of one or two people, but of a larger group, it's it's extremely useful. Um, you know, we, we're happy to take individual issues as well. Um, and my favorite, I you know, I see we're running to the end, but you know, on a, what, what makes it worth being a counselor? Um, you know, sometimes I wake up in the morning and I say, what does make it work? But I got word that one of our farmers um, had, gotten a bill for $5,000 for an estimated water bill that went back five years where they had paid every time the water bill came in, they paid the full amount and who would know it was estimated. And um, I got it reduced to zero. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was a very, and it wasn't so much, I got it, but I got a meeting <laughs> and they said, sometimes if you plead the case, I said, how can you not read the water meter for five years. I mean, I could, maybe a year goes by, but five. Um, 
And so, so that was like, it's, it was so tangible. <laughs> My kids said, yay, mom. <laughs> but, but it just felt real. So little, little issues that are big issues for people. Um, we, we were, we're happy to see what we can do to help. And um, I'll just ask you, Meg, or anyone from Dona, actually, would you like to provide any updates um, with respect to Dona before we close? Um, just really briefly, uh, we finished the master plan study group. We're a group of 15 uh, led by Michelle. Uh, went through the town. The, the idea is to take the town's excellent planning that they've already done, particularly the master plan, the transportation plan, and the, and the environment and sustainability plan, and figure out how to help the town implement those in North Amherst. So we're now setting up a North Amherst Village Improvement Committee to go over those recommendations and figure out uh, which and how best to implement them. Again, aligned with what the town's already said it wants to do. Um, a lot of focus on transportation, uh, streets, intersections, but also uh, pedestrian safety and bicycle safety, but also on uh, uh, sustainable business development, conservation, and protecting farms. Meg, and, where could somebody see the report? If if uh, um, it's on our website, if anybody wants it, they can find it on our website, or they I could send it to anyone who wants it. Um, and if anyone wants to be on the neighborhood, uh, North Amherst Village Improve, it's sort of a little like village improve. But anyway, it, we like words that you can say. So the acronym is NAVIC, North Amherst Village Improvement Committee. Uh, we'd, we're looking for, we were gonna finalize the committee charge on uh, Monday afternoon, and we will be looking for people who wanna be on that. I don't think it's, it's not a, we, th we think it'll be an ongoing committee, but with changing membership so nobody has to, serve for the rest of their life, but um, we're working closely with the mill district to collaborate. Wonderful. There's a whole lot of other stuff, but that's enough for now. Okay. The other <laughs> things are kind of percolating still. But the, the, the North Amherst Village Improvement, we, we consider North Amherst all the way to Cushman. And um, we, we really are a village center in North Amherst. We have, you know, we have a post office and a library. That's kind of, what makes and wonderful shops and I just want to encourage everyone to go to Cisco's for breakfast or lunch over on uh, Coles Road. It's a wonderful um, place to eat, and it's run by uh, Francisco. Uh, I can't remember his last name. Who uh, who owns and runs um, Amherst Pizza, and it's a lovely, lovely place to have breakfast or lunch Tuesday through Sunday. Awesome. Thank you, Meg. Oh, okay. Well, it's 825. I think we promised. What, what did we promise? Eight this, this, we said be <laughs> over by 830. So I think okay. we're, we're going we're, we're going to overachieve by ending. We can end five, <laughs> we can end five minutes. Lynn, Lynn's been doing so remarkable, ending the meetings, getting the meetings done faster. You got <laughs> done at 931 last night. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we did add an extra meeting but that's good that was we did. we did we added but we added an important extra meeting yeah exactly on monday the 27th yeah. where we will have all kinds of discussions about how we are going to bond and afford the school so um, an extra meeting on monday yep yeah and if we haven't said it already thanks to all of you for being here and being yep. engaged and um just showing up for us you know we i i think i speak for myself and kathy and probably lynn that we really appreciate it Absolutely. value it it was great to hear all the support for the school <laughs> thank you all right so, thank you everyone and have a great rest of your tuesday yep. See you see you next time, whenever that might be. <laughs> Good night. I'll I'll set the recording, Kath. I get that all set.